Arthur Eflin was born to the late Jake Eflin and Mary Berman on April 20th, 1929 in New Haven, Connecticut. Arthur's father was born to Benjamin Eflin, who was from the Ukraine, and Goldie Slavin from Russia, so we can trace some countries of origin. Arthur's father passed away when he was 10 months old, and so he remained devoted to his mother as he grew older. Arthur received his teaching degree in 1952 in what is today known as Southern Connecticut State University. Two years later, in 1954, he earned a Master's of Science degree at the University of Connecticut. Eventually, Arthur received his doctorate in education from Stanford University in 1965. It was there in Stanford in 1961 that Arthur discovered that art education had a history. He acknowledged that the history of art education was an accomplished fact and that there were more discoveries to be made. His dissertation in 1965 at Stanford was, the effects of perceptual training upon the differentiation of form in children's drawings, which went unpublished. When Arthur began his teaching career, he may not have known he would devote his life to art education. Here's how it all began. He was a teacher of art at the regional district number four in Connecticut, Ohio. So he taught in the towns of Essex, Deep River, Chester, and West Hartford from 1953 to 1959. In 1959, he became the art consultant for the Millbrae School District in California. Arthur actually initiated that school's district's first art programs. He then became an uh, acting instructor in art education at Stanford University from 1962 to 1964. Afterwards, he was assistant professor of art at Fresno State College in California from 1964 to 1965. He was then the assistant professor of art education at The Ohio State University from 1965 through 1969. Eventually, he became the acting chairman of Division of Art Education at The Ohio State University from 1950, 1969 to 1996. He remained a professor emeritus for 10 years thereafter at Ohio State University. Arthur also held visiting scholar appointments in Australia, Brazil, Canada, Japan, Spain, Sweden, and Taiwan. Apart from his educational accomplishments, Arthur also received many national recognitions. He received the honorable mention in painting in Connecticut, 1957 through 1959, the June Keen McPhee Award in 1984, the Manuel Barkin Award, the Lowenfeld Memorial Lecture Award, the Distinguished Fellow, he was a Distinguished Fellow for the National Arts Education Association. In 2003, he received an Achievement Award from the Miami University. He was also a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Industrial Arts in Helsinki, Finland. Arthur published two books and co-authored a third. His books have been influential amongst art educators and scholars. His first book in 1990 is A History of Art Education, Intellectual and Social Currents in Teaching the Visual Arts. This book has since become a flagship in many higher education institutions around the world teaching art education. The book focuses on the institutional settings and movements that shaped art education mainly from the 19th century and beyond. Arthur carefully delineates the evolution of art education in the Western world and ends with influences on its current practices. As you can see here, I've added uh, some reviews, a must for every art educator, art teachers who've never read, who've, who've read it. Uh, confused art teachers say, now it all makes sense. Uh, why didn't I read this before, said I. An action-packed sequence of art education from the Art Teachers Tribune. Five stars, perhaps six, APU Arts Education students. His second book in 1996 is co-authored with Carrie J. Friedman and Patricia L. Stirr, titled Postmodern Art Education, An Approach to Curriculum. This book looks into cultural theory, 
multiculturalism, and modernism of art education in the classrooms. Unlike many of his publication, this text includes lesson plans designed, designed for students from pre-K all the way through the university level. All the sample lessons are postmodern and include numerous illustrations. His last book, Art in Cognition, Integrating the Visual Arts in the Curriculum, debuted in 2002. Here he seeks to enhance how art can contribute significantly to the cognitive goals of education. He believes each individual constructs their own view of reality according to their social, personal, and cultural context. In other words, each of us is guided by our own purposes and interests in seeking to understand the world through our experience of it. Kami writes, at the core, Eflin has held to the conviction that works of visual art have a substantial cultural value and their study warrants a permanent place more central than their present one. Evelyn discusses how new developments in cognitive science can be applied to art education, especially children. He points out implications for teaching practices, curriculum, and the reform of general education. Arthur also contributed to the Handbook of Research and Policy in Art Education in 2004 with a couple of chapters. His 30th chapter is titled Emerging, Emerging Visions of Art Education, which explores the role that educational visions play in charting the future of art education. The 33rd chapter is titled Art Education as Imaginative Cognition. Here he explores the natural imaginations of children and how it was viewed in history by progressive educators. It was believed the goal was to allow the child's imagination to unfold in unforeseen ways. Arthur also wrote and published many, many, many articles that can be found at the Penn State University, the Ohio State University Library, just to name a few. There'd be no justice in trying to capture all of the topics he covered. Much of Eflin's research is owed to his colleagues in his own art department at Ohio State University. He's recognized Michael Parson for his research in cognitive development, Georgina Short on transfer learning, and Judith Korosik on ways of misunderstanding. Arthur also authored the Elementary and Secondary Guidelines in Art Education for the State of Ohio in 1970. It was the first state art education curriculum guide in the United States that demonstrated how the study of art history, art criticism, and art in society could be integrated with the more traditional area of art production in the teaching of art. Many school districts in Ohio, other states, and other countries have used the elementary and middle school secondary guides to plan their own courses of study and curriculum guides. It has also served as a model to other state departments of education in the development of their state art curriculum guides. Arthur would make a revision of the guidelines in 1992. By that time, 20 states had their own versions of innovative approaches to art education curriculum development. The Ohio State Art Education at the time, the consultant at the time says, without doubt, the original elementary art guidelines should be considered a forerunner to an international curriculum reform movement that has become the major force in the field of contemporary art education. The guidelines were also mount, meant to help organize art education advocacy efforts in schools and communities. Art teachers have found it useful in developing long range plans to promote improvements in their art programs with school boards, administrators, and the community. So what was his philosophy? Well, I think the reason he spent so much time with art and cognition was to undo all the damage that was done in the past by biases, as he outlines in his book, A History of Art Education. He felt that proving the recent understanding, understandings of the mind and the nature of human intelligence required in art education would elevate its intellectual status and be implemented in general education at par with other subject matters, such as literature, mathematics, and science. Eflin writes, works of art often make heavy cognitive demands on thinking. He points out some of the problems are a serious lack of awareness of the substantive roles art can play in developing cognition, 
and that educators are unsure of how to use the arts to develop cognitive abilities in children or of the means of assessing such attainments. Arthur's views were largely influenced by the cognitive revolution, which came to prominence in the 1950s. He says, another influence is found in the rise of the cognitive science. These cognitive science Sciences were comprised of concepts from a variety of disciplines and employed a number of methodologies. Prior to that, psychology relied heavily on behaviorism, which is how one learns when interacting with their environment or stimuli. Arthur cites Jean, Jean Piaget, Lev Vygotsky, Jerome Bruner, Elliot Eisner, and later Howard Gardner as prominent figures in the field of cognitive development. These cognitive developmentalists came up with the concept of stages to explain the hierarchical nature of learning. He believed that the emergence of cognitive development had deep implications for general education, but that its impact on art education was more profound than most subjects in their curriculum. Arthur's philosophy really came about in taking pieces from these cognitive developmentalists, but also by calling out their shortcomings. For example, Arthur says, I called attention to this developmental tradition because it has profoundly imposed a long-standing mindset within the culture of practice in art education, where the best teaching is thought to be no teaching at all, and where artistic accomplishments are judged primarily for their therapeutic rather than educative value. From Piaget, he acknowledged that we become familiar with our environment when we begin to regu rec recognize regularities in our experiences. Piaget's cognitive developmental views were greatly influenced by his early training and work as a biologist. Piaget realized that all living things constantly adapt to the physical environment and its organization, which he then applied to biological and cognitive development. From Vygotsky, he takes an alternative view that mental activity is a result of social learning through the acquisition of social signs taken from language learning and the internalization of culture and social interaction. From Jerome Bruner, he took his hypothesis, which became the hallmark for curricular reform at the time, being that any subject can be taught effectively in some form to any child at any stage of development. Arthur says, lastly, what I take from Eisner and Gardner's argument is that different domains of knowledge utilize differing cognitive abilities for their mastery, and that such capacities are not likely to evolve if absent from the life experiences of individuals. He also took into account Gardner's notion of multiple intelligences. In subscribing to differing points of cognitive views, Arthur aligned himself with cognitive flexibility, which enables learners to use their knowledge in relevant ways in real world situations. It's sort of a mashup of all the discoveries being made. Cognitively flexible students take learning to be multidirectional, involving the formation of multiple perspectives, Eflin says. This position is clearly seen in his argument that arts education functions in the same cognitive ways as other curricular content. To sum this up, Arthur states, what I'm saying is that the activation of the learner's cognitive potential requires the ability to function in a variety of domains, both well-structured and ill-structured. Moreover, if it is important for students to have experiences with both types of learning situations, and if art is complex and ill-structured, then instruction should honestly represent this state of affairs. He does acknowledge, however, that current views have been shifting towards realizing the difference between cognitive and non-cognitive subject. Yet not much has been done about it because art is still seen as a way to express emotions and feelings and not ideas. Arthur was also an artist, appearing in many juried exhibitions across the country from 1951 to 1962. His art included oil and watercolor paintings and photography. He also had one-man shows. For example, he had a one-man show paintings at the Artist Cooperative Gallery in San Francisco 
1961. Uh, another uh, one-man show at the Artist Cooperative, also in San Francisco, 1963. Another one at the Treseder Memorial Union in Stanford University. Uh, he also had a one-man show photographs of at Zanesville Art Institute. Uh, that was uh, along with uh, his wife. To his family and friends, Arthur was appropriately known as Art. His wife, Jenny Flock, who he says meant the world to him, is also an artist who is known primarily for her pottery. In a 2001 interview, she says of Arthur, my husband has been very supportive. He values my work. Jenny, however, states in a recent interview that she was not very happy with him and she, stuck, and she was stuck in a miserable marriage. In her 70s, she met another man who she would come to live with. His wife says, meanwhile, Arthur's mind left, he's demented, and he's in a nursing home, a full care facility. Jenny also mentions they had an adopted son. Arthur's obituary says he had a son named David, so I'm not sure if this was the same adopt adopted son Jenny spoke of. There is no record of other children. Arthur was very fond of David, whom he shared many fishing trips with to in Canada. David is currently manager of Delaware Zoning and Code, City Government, Urban Planning and Development in Ohio. In 2000, Arthur and David presented at the NAEA conference in Los Angeles on what art educators and city planners can teach each other. He also had a special relationship with his childhood friends, Robin and Marnie White, who provided lifelong guidance that shaped the arch of his existence. Arthur loved the outdoors as he would go on backpacking expeditions in the high Sierras. Art also enjoyed gardening, discussing baseball, a good salami, and spending time with his grandson, Eric. Arthur died on April 11, 2020, at the age of 90, just nine days before his birthday in Lewis Center in Ohio. Arthur's legacy lives on with his cornerstone books and guidelines he set back in 1970. His biggest influence though is a large group of younger art educators that studied with and under him. It is also worth noting that many new developments have been made since his work, which in some cases have drawn criticism. For example, Kami states, Eflin mistakenly assumes that every would-be artist hopes that his work will be understood that its gist will be grasped, or at least graspable by the viewer. It is argued that with the rise of radical modernism in the 20th century, that argument is not valid because many artists create works of art knowing that their work is not comprehensible, but for a select few. Therefore, studying the art of today is different from studying some of the classics whose intentions were more clear. He stands in a position where he negates the artist's intentions. Though this topic is further debatable, it goes to show that Arthur left behind room for much discourse. As I previously mentioned, his books and writings are still considered re relevant and used in higher education, even though you know, some stuff may be outdated. His contributions to arts education and cognitive development is and will continue to be heavily influential to any educator.